Veterans Day Parade in Martinsburg that started at 11 o'clock. Uh, Ken Matson, who is one of our very active uh, listeners, viewers on the program, has been uh, co-host on occasion, too. Uh, I asked him to send me some pictures from his uh, march on Saturday. He was going to be, I think he said, in the World War II uniform. So I said, Ken, send me some photos. So he sent a few. There's Ken going by there. And uh, what other ones you got to roll by there, Dylan? There you go. And these are some other ones that Ken sent, not just of him, but uh, some others, too, the Veterans Day Parade. We recorded the Veterans Day Parade, and that will be played back on this uh, TV10 channel that we operate here uh, as well. So for all you veterans who marched in the parade, thank you for your service. And it was uh, a pleasure to have the opportunity to record the parade and to play it back here on TV10. Uh, I'll find out what the schedule of playback is, and then I'll let, make sure we announce those times and whatever. Via telephone. On this Veterans Day, Dr. Stephen A. Goldman, he has been a frequent guest on the program, adjunct professor at Shepherd University, has written books uh, about veterans and has done a lot of work with veterans and PTSD and uh, made a lot of inroads, too, has, has uh, come up with some fascinating information on the subject. Uh, Dr. Steve, good morning. Thanks so much for, for being on the program once again. It's great to have you here with us. Always a pleasure. Yeah, great. Uh, Before we go, let me yeah, give a ahead. shout out to uh, uh, Dr. Goldman in previous discussions. He's given an insight to, a, I'm going to speak about Civil War right now, sure. Civil War battles from a perspective that we don't normally see. We think of a certain regiment going against a certain other regiment. Uh, Steve is able to give us behind the scenes view of what had happened to the folks around the, uh, around the battle, the impact on the farmers, the impact on the merchants. And I've always enjoyed that very much. Steve, your insight to something that I've not really thought about. Uh, Bill, I really appreciate that. And um, a, a couple things about that. As you know, I'm not just a Civil War historian. Um, I'm a military historian in the sense that I look at Civil War in relation to veterans of all wars. And, um, and again, I appreciate, Bill, your comments because I use history to look at the present and the future. I use information that we've learned about what it means to go to war since the Civil War. And on a day like this, on Veterans Day, which is not just an American holiday, it's an international holiday, because of course it's Armistice Day. Um, I have a lot of thoughts today about that. And also the distinction between Memorial Day and Veterans Day. Memorial Day is designed for those who have, who have lost their lives, in particular during service. Veterans Day is different. It's about the survivors. It's about those who have been in service throughout the history of not just our country, but around the world. And that really ties in to, again, thanks for the shout out, Bill, to what I try and do with what I've learned, not just in studying Civil War and Reconstruction, but my work with veterans literally over the last four decades, which, as you know, has been one of the highlights of my career. Yeah, one of the problems that I have with the Veterans Day or Memorial Day is that we take the individual out of the picture. We look at them in a total, a veteran. But among the veterans are thousands and thousands of individual stories that I think are much more important than the collective title of veteran. And unfortunately, these individual stories are often uh, minimized or glanced over and that and I'm going to circle back and give you another shout out this is I think one of your great strengths is you individ individualize those stories wow um, and that's exactly and that's exactly what I try and do uh, you know the, the book that's out the book I have coming out hopefully um, in, in the spring I that, that's exactly what I try and do because the it humanizes. I mean, I always tell my students, and whenever I give talks, when you look at the battlefield monuments, for example, at Gettysburg or Antietam or Monocacy, they may be made of stone, but they're about flesh and blood. And, you know, the, the individual stories, and of course, you know, Bill, we've seen this from war after war, the finest 
representations in film or uh, the great books that have come out of each of the wars, I find the most amazing material is often the memoirs. And Civil War, coming to mind, is Rufus Dawes. Um, World War One, you know, the great poets, most of whom died during the war, like Wilfred Owen. Men like Eugene Sledge, these two amazing books about the Pacific Theater, the great Vietnam writers, uh, Carl Melantes, Tim O'Brien, Phil Caputo. That's exactly the point that you're making. And when you make it personal, when you make it individual, I couldn't agree with you more that it's the focus on the individual that I think really hammers home the costs. And at the same time, what happens when one survives war and then when, how one utilizes that survival in civilian life, which, as you know, is one of the themes I really try and emphasize. So I, I, I really appreciate the, the shout-out on that because that's exactly what I try and do. Steve, this is John. Uh, there's also something really horrific, I think, about this day, 11-11, uh, being Armistice Day or, or Veterans Day here. The fact that you know, at the 11th day of the 11th month, and actually this, it's when, the, when World War I ended, and I think it went to the 11th minute of the 11th hour, right? Yes, it did. So, yes, it did. And the, the belligerent parties fought, as I understand it, vigorously until the last second of the war. So even though these parties knew that the end was three minutes away or two minutes away or one minute away, they were still throwing artillery and bullets at each other. And there's I, just something horrific about that. I have the actual statistics right in front of me that there were 11,000 casualties on both sides on November 11th with an estimated 2,750 men killed. Wow. And there was a marvelous documentary uh, I saw several months ago, I, I believe on the military channel, about what happened that day. And when you read and talk about World War I, the criminal use of men by the, um, the French, the Germans in particular, is, is beyond despicable. And that's why it's a tough war to, to, to teach about, because in that way it was anomalous. That's also one of the reasons why when, when the American Expeditionary Force entered the war, Pershing refused initially to have any of his soldiers under any jurisdiction other than American generals. Now, you know that he made one exception. African-American troops served under French generals. That was the, that was the uh, compromise that he made. As it turned out, the African-American troops served brilliantly, as you know, and were treated much better by the French and by Europeans than they were treated in the United States. That irony there. But you're absolutely right. And when you read these, and I have them right in front of me from the Commonwealth War, War Creators Commission website, the stories of the men who died that day. And it's even... 100, more than 100 years later, they're stories that make you sick. They insisted on attacking up to literally the last second. And there's, there's another message, and I hope I don't sidetrack us our discussion here, but there's another message that with the settlement of the First World War, retribution was so severe that it really drove the Germans toward the Second World War. And uh, which I, I, we all suffered because of that. But I have one personal story. I had a, uh, a neighbor who fought in the First World War. He was several, several years older. Uh, and, but he, he was a pacifist and did not, but he was drafted out of college and served a couple of so weeks in, uh, on the battlefront at the day of the armistice. Uh, the, Ger the Germans were required to pay money that they did not have. So he and his battalion, a lot of his colleagues, were put in a prisoner of war camp for nearly five years uh, uh, just because they could not pay their debts. So. Again, all true. I, I have to, I am really, it's necessary to point out that there is another commemoration that takes place 
over yesterday and the day before, and that's the anniversary of Kristallnacht, November 9th and 10th, 1938. Yes. And obviously that has great meaning for me and for others, and it's obviously the link between World War One and what happened before um, the United States entered World War II. So this is a tough day in a lot of ways. And um, the gravity of this day, paired with the history, I think gives it its gives us a lot of pause. And the other thing I would mention is that we finally have a national World War One monument that really went under the radar. You know, it opened it opened in September in downtown D.C. I don't know why. They waited. They didn't wait to open it today, <laughs> but it opened on uh, in September, and that's the first time we actually have a monument, a national monument to World War One. I. I didn't know that. You know that it never really dawned on me. All the times I've been in D.C. to look at the different memorials and monuments, it never hit that there wasn't a World War One. Yeah, nor had yep. I. We we kind of focused on the Korean War has been forgotten war, but what Steve's saying is we should have been focused on the First World War as well. Well, I think what's happening now is that people are making the link between between the tremendous importance of World War One and things that followed. And I can tell you, when I, oh, I taught one of my seminars at Shepherd, um my students were tremendously interested in World War One. I. I kept adding more and more material about World War One um, because of the, because of the great interest in it. And the thing, and again, Bill, going back to exactly what you said before, I talk a lot about the World War One poets. Again, many of whom did not survive the war. And um, there's there's a marvelous book about the first um, expedition to Everest called um, Into the Silence, which is about, which I didn't know this, and I, I'm sure the three of you will find this fascinating as I did, almost all the members of the initial expedition to Everest were World War I veterans who didn't know what to do with themselves having survived the war that nobody expected to survive. And it's quite a book talking about what I also write a lot about, the warrior identity. What one does with one's, what you learn from war, what you learn from survival. And again, as I always emphasize, that survivor guilt generally morphs into survivor obligation. And it's quite a story. It's also a story about a generation, as we know, called the lost generation, trying to deal with the, the carnage in, in Europe and what one would do next. You know, yeah. it, it's, it's interesting how history kind of folds in on itself that that world war one was over a hundred years ago and my grandfather was in it um it that just was mine <laughs> and and this this really came in, in focus to me uh, my grandfather uh clifford gilstrap was wounded in france shot in the elbow and and he was released from the army and i have his i have his dates of service and we don't have, we know he got a Purple Heart, but we don't have the medal. So I go through the process with the Department of the Army or the Veterans Affairs to get his medal, which is, is a thing you can do until you start to fill out the forms. He was born, and, and the forms say, you know, date of birth, 19 blank. You know, we fill it out. Well, it was actually 1898. And what was the state? Well, it was Oklahoma Indian Territory. <laughs> so when you say... <laughs> <laughs> so it's impossible to fill out the forms. Life has and, changed. Yeah. And what's his social security number? Eh, can't do that one. What's the no so, social security numbers back then? And yeah. service number wasn't a thing. At least we we don't we don't have it. So it, it was like okay, we we can't. There's no way to use the internet to get the information that I need to fill out this form to get his. The information didn't exist at the exactly. time he was doing exactly. His thing. Yeah, uh, yeah it, it's funny you mentioned 1898 because that was the first year that the Pension Bureau sent the questionnaire to Union veterans to get personal data. And you can imagine how valuable that was when I do my research because it had their marriages, it had other information, their children. 
Um, but that was the first time they'd ever done that. They also did it in 1917, uh, before the United States entered the war. So, yeah, these, these, but by the way, my grandfather served, but he was not overseas. He did not leave uh, Monmouth, New Jersey, but he was, he was in um, the service in World War I. Yeah, the, the, the stories resonate. And the, the, there was also something else I would like to mention on Veterans Day. And, and Bill, this directly involves you and I. That, and I don't know if a lot of people are aware of this, that since 1862, all officers in the U.S. military and non-military federal employees, like Bill and I, have taken the same oath. Yes. To support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. The enlisted personnel, same oath in 1962. I think this should be reiterated, and it has been reiterated, as you know, by President Biden when he spoke at West Point and when Mark Milley retired from the service as the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. This is vital to say this again and again, because the United States military takes an oath to the Constitution, not to an administration, a president, individual. It is to defend the Constitution. And certainly the Civil War, and other wars that we've seen and talk about. And the relationship between the military in the United States and civilians is vital to remember. And also to, to remember that those who serve in the military are American citizens. And that they have the same responsibility as citizens as those of us who are not serving in the military. And that, as we know, is something that has been, I mean, it, it started with the American Revolution, but the concept of citizen soldiers really was emphasized in the Civil War. And the men of the Civil War, the men of the Union, made a great distinction between those who served in Europe because they felt they were hirelings. They felt that they were serving monarchs, not serving their own interests because they weren't citizen soldiers. And that's yeah, and that's a concept that has continued throughout our history. And on, on Veterans Day, I did want to emphasize that because I think it's so important. What is the distinction of citizen soldier as opposed to what? Well, it, citizen soldier implies, and again, let me point out, and I've, I've gotten pushback on this from some of the historians, the men of the Union vastly did not have military training when they enlisted. By the end of the war, they were soldiers to rival the finest in the world, soldiers and sailors to rival the finest in the world. They became professionals, but they were citizen soldiers. They had not been trained as professional soldiers. They were not in standing armies. That was really the distinction that was made by Union soldiers between the European armies, because they were professional armies, particularly those who served the Commonwealth, you know, served the United Kingdom. They had tremendous pride of being citizen soldiers, but they also had tremendous pride in their becoming soldiers to rival the professionals. Well, now you have a full volunteer military, but of course, those were also career. There were also career military personnel. So we've we've generally looked at the concept of citizen soldiers. World War II being a great example, where citizens who had never been in the military were mobilized. And as you know, it took years to train the men and women who served in World War II. And the Germans had great contempt for American soldiers. As it turned out, they underestimated the quality of American soldiers, and they certainly found that out in 1944 and 45. Uh, sometimes, Steve, I'd like to develop this a little bit more. It's my opinion that prior to World War II, we were very, very poorly trained, and it's only in 1938-39 did folks like Marshall realize how deficient we were in training, and uh, fortunately by December the 7th, 1941, we had actually had two or three large-scale training exercises. Prior to that, we were woefully unprepared. You're absolutely right, and we saw it, we saw it in the wars, because um, in the Civil War, the the one of the one of the benefits of racism, if you want to put it that way, 
is that when the USCT, when the United States Colored Troop regiments were formed, their junior officers were all highly experienced um, non-commissioned officers who got their commissions to become officers in the USCT. So most of us feel that the officers in the USCT were better than the officers in the white regiments because they were already highly experienced soldiers from the first two years of the war. That's absolutely true. My father-in-law, who was a decorated soldier in World War II, always talked about the tremendous training he got in the Signal Corps before he landed at Utah Beach. And exactly the point you're making, Bill, that the training was much better in World War II than it had been in previous wars. Having said that, in the Civil War and in World War I, Korea and Nam, obviously, if you survived, particularly in combat, you became a better, better in combat and better as a soldier, as a sailor, as a Marine, which what so many of the veterans wrote about. But starting with World War II, you are absolutely right. The training was much better in relation to what they were expecting when they, they eventually got into combat. Yeah, uh, we're about to run out of time, but you talked about poets in uh, Second World, uh, First World War two or three times. One of my favorite poets was Joyce Kilmer, uh, wrote Trees. Trees. Uh, but he, uh, uh, he died on the front line in, World War, in France, the Second World, uh, First World War, uh, as a head in the scout group. So, uh, uh, so he was one that I'm sure is included in your memoirs toward the poets. Well, I also would mention someone who survived the war. Uh, who wrote one of the great books about serving in World War I, and that's Robert Graves, who yes. wrote Goodbye to All That, which is just an amazing memoir of what it was like to serve in World War I. And, um, yeah, it's, and of course, today, so many of us recite and remember uh, Flanders Field. Yes. Yeah. Written by a Canadian physician who did not survive the war. We are down to our final minute. Uh, Dr. Stephen A. Goldman has been our guest, adjunct professor at Shepherd University, and he's written several books as well. So, Steve, can you tell us uh, where we can uh, locate the Stephen Goldman books? Well, uh, the Stephen Goldman book, <laughs> book, book. At the moment, book is at Amazon. The next book I'm hoping, which is my actual Civil War book, is hoping to be out early next year. And I do have some uh, articles that I hope to be publishing, including, Bill, one about... Uh, the three men who are vital at the Battle of Monocacy. Yeah, very good. Stephen, thank you very much. Appreciate your time this morning. Always good to speak with you. Uh, always a pleasure. Thank you, gentlemen. Thanks, Stephen. Take care.